All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, today's webinar in our fall series uh, at the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice uh, at Eastern Mennonites, uh, Eastern Mennonite University Center for Justice and Peace Building. Um, my name is Brian Gum, and I am a technology facilitator for these uh, webinars. And I'll say a few words here at the beginning about using the technology. Um, and I say every time I do this little technology intro, um, I am the technology guy, but I'm also a graduate of uh, the Center for Justice and Peace Building, where my emphasis was in restorative justice. Um, and so Howard Zare and Carl Stauffer were two of my professors. Um, so I'm always very happy to help out with these. Um, so uh, the, we try to structure these so they're very discussion oriented and we love to have people uh, who are viewing be able to participate. Um, so while the panelists are all able to see and hear each other, uh, we can't hear all of you um, and, uh, but we do want to hear your voice and the way we can do that is by, uh, if you look down in the bottom right of the, um, of the webinar screen, there should be a button there that says Q and A. And if you click that Q and A button, it'll be a place where you can type in questions for the panelists, uh, as the discussion goes on. And so that is the primary way that um, you all participating, uh, watching mostly, can have a voice in the discussion. We certainly um, value that as, as, part of these, as part of these webinars. So by all means, please ask questions throughout. And then uh, Carl and also um, Sarah will keep track of those and they'll get interjected into the live discussion as we go through. Um, so that's my little technology. Uh, spiel, and now I can turn things over to Carl, and he'll do a more proper introduction for the rest of the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian, and we want to welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, as part of our CJP webinar series. It's, it's really been um, a joy to have this webinar series running and to have each of you participating, uh, hopefully many of you who've been participating in the past, and you're continuing to uh, find uh, these discussions useful. We're looking at um, these webinars as a place to really look at um, critical and frontier issues in the field of restorative justice. We're wanting it to be a place where we're convening some interesting, new, marginal, some, some discussions of practice and ideas about restorative justice that might be outside of the status quo, a little bit more on the margins, and that's our interest, is convening new spaces for new conversations here at the Howard Zare Institute. Today, um, we're particularly excited and, and uh, about uh, this webinar and our guests with us. Uh, as you full well know, this webinar is going to be moving us in the direction of preparing restorative justice educators. So let me just say this, one of the areas that restorative justice is really exploding is in the schools and its application in the schools. And we've moved from it being a one of many um, possible models for teachers to use in classrooms to now looking at whole schools being effectively restorative and whole school districts realigning policy and realigning procedures around restorative processes, not only in their discipline, but in the way they conduct the classroom and conduct decision making and work amongst themselves as teachers and administration. So we're, we're moving into, we're far beyond the question of whether RJ is appropriate in schools. We're looking at more how do we train our educators today uh, to, to effectively use restorative justice to accomplish what we would like to in the school. So that's what we're about here as we come together. And I hope each of you have had a chance to look a little bit more at the theme and the questions that were put there online. I wanna introduce our panelists so that we don't take any more time with that. We're, we're really pleased to have Fania Davis with us. Fania is the co-founder and executive director of the Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, active in civil rights, black liberation, women's, prisoners, peace, anti-racial violence, anti-apartheid movements. Fania practiced as a civil rights lawyer for 27 years. 
Uh, she then received her PhD in Indigenous Studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies in 2003. Since then, she has been engaged in the search for healing alternatives to adversarial justice. This search brought her to Oakland and to founding the RJOY in 2005. RJOY works uh, to interrupt the cycles of youth violence and incarceration by promoting institutional shifts toward restorative approaches that actively engage families, communities, and systems to repair harm and prevent reoffending. Fani also serves as the counsel to the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. Her research interests include employ exploring the indigenous roots, particularly the African indigenous roots of restorative justice. Fani is also a mother of two children, a dancer, and a practitioner of yoga. Fana, Fania, it's really good to have you here uh, with us today. Along, along, with, along with Fania is Eric Butler. Uh, welcome, Eric. Eric is one of the R. Joy School coordinators at a particular high school called Bunch High School uh, in Oakland. Uh, Eric is a Hurricane Katrina survivor who relocated to Oakland, California. Eric successfully facilitated grief circles in response to homicide and extreme violence in Oakland area schools as part of Catholic Charities Crisis Response Program. He has also worked with Youth Uprising as a lead mediator. Eric has affiliated with the NFL's Indianapolis Colts football team in the 1990s and discontinued, and discontinued due to an injury. He is uh, gaining increasing renown for his restorative justice work with youth in West Oakland. And then our third panelist and MC is our, is our very own here at Eastern Mennonite University, Kathy Evans. Dr. Kathy Evans is assistant professor of education in our, in our education program here at Eastern Mennonite. She teaches courses in special education and educational theory and is particularly interested in school and classroom climates school discipline procedures and the ways in which restorative justice is applied to those educational contexts. She holds a PhD in educational psychology and research from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where her dissertation research employed phenomenological interviews with middle school students about their experiences with in-school suspension. Prior to graduate school, Kathy was a middle and high school special educator for students identified as having learning behavioral and emotional challenges. Her research, teaching, and scholarship focus on ways in which teachers participate in creating more just and equitable educational opportunities for all students, including those with disability labels, those who are exhibiting challenging behavior, and those who are marginalized for a variety of reasons. While at EMU, Kathy has been active in furthering the field of restorative justice um, in education, both through scholarship and teaching, and has been instrumental in helping to set up our program in restorative justice in education uh, collaboratively, and has been working with our Center for Justice and Peace Building on RJE, restorative justice issues. Um, and beginning this fall, 2014, the EMU Education Department will begin offering both a concentration and a certificate in restorative justice education, uh, thanks to the wonderful leadership of Kathy. And so we've got a great lineup here. These three are going to take the conversation forward uh, from here. Uh, Brian has indicated if you have questions along the way, uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom right of your webinar screen to submit your question. And we'll pick those up a little bit later on uh, for the last, the last part of, of uh, this, this webinar. So I'm going to turn it over uh, at this point to Kathy Evans and uh, let Kathy pick up the conversation from here. Kathy? Thanks so much, Carl. It's really uh, exciting to be here with everybody, and I'm thrilled to have Eric and Fania joining us. Um, I'm looking forward to having some conversation about restorative justice in educational contexts, but in particular, how do we equip teachers to be better prepared to be restorative justice educators? So um, I want to start off with just a, an open-ended question. Um, could you describe the work that you do in restorative justice in schools and pay particular attention to um, how you equip teachers to be restorative justice educators? And we can start with Eric or Fania, one of the two of y'all. <coughs> Okay, I'll start. Uh, let me just very briefly talk about how I came to restorative justice. 
Um, I, um, as was indicated in the introduction earlier, uh, was involved for many decades, at least three decades, in almost every uh, major social movement of my time and became a civil rights trial lawyer. And so for many decades was fighting against racism, fighting against sexism, fighting against capitalism, and on and on, and reached a point in the mid 90s where I felt that I was out of balance and needed more, I intuitively knew that I needed more healing energies, more feminine energies, more creative energies to come back into balance. At this point, um, after having dreams and experiencing synchronicities, I ended up in a PhD program where I was allowed to go to Africa and study with a great Zulu healer. Um, I finished that program, got my dissertation, and couldn't find a job in uh, the field of healing, so went back to law, kicking and screaming. But good thing I did, because as a lawyer, I was invited by another lawyer to, to attend the conference where I learned for the first time about restorative justice. And I was, it was a real epiphany because it integrated the lawyer, the healer, and the warrior in me. And so from there, I traveled uh, to conferences. I contacted Howard Zayer and Kay Pranis and other leaders of the restorative justice movement and devoured everything I could on the, uh, the subject of restorative justice. Uh, I ended up in 2005, uh, after bringing Kay Pranis and others to do trainings, um, uh, co-founding Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. Uh, whose mission was to promote restorative justice principles and practices in schools, communities, and justice system. So we started a pilot program in 2006, uh, which was so successful in, in completely eliminating violence, in reducing suspension rates by 87%, in increasing test scores significantly, and in completely eliminating uh, teacher attrition that the whole uh, district became very interested and by 2010 ended up um, adopting restorative justice as official school policy. So we had one school with restorative justice in 2006 and seven, and now we have 30 um, um, with uh, a, a large staff of restorative justice employees in the school district. So today I continue to provide technical assistance and training uh, to teachers and to administrators uh, and others who are implementing this work on the ground. We're also working with the Oakland Unified School District to develop implementation guides for teachers and other practitioners. So that's basically, that's an overview of the work that I have done and am still doing today in restorative justice and education. Um, so for me, restorative justice is um, primarily about building relationships. So uh, how it looks on my campus is we, we try to build a relationship with every single person on campus and have every single person build a relationship with every single person on campus. So it's about, all about building relationships. Um, as far as teachers are concerned, um, I, I want to I get them involved in circles of support and accountability and, and all, all the different types of cir circles that we offer on the campus as much as possible. Um, I want to teach the students how to tell their stories. I want this, the teachers to be able to see their students. Um, it, it is, it's so easy. We have all of the answers if a, if a kid is deficient to um, algebra or, or science. We will put them in tutoring. But if, but if a kid doesn't have those social and emotional things that, <clears throat> that are so important, we usually just kick them out of our community. But what we do in restorative justice is we put the student right in front of the teacher so the student can build those relationships. And it's, it's, it's much harder to kick somebody out of your community when you have a relationship with that person and you're friends with them. So I guess in a nutshell, we're trying to make friends all over the campus. That's beautiful. Um, can I ask just a little bit more? I, I, for both of you, I, I hear you saying the word training. Um, and uh, implementing guidelines, uh, it's in a practical sense. What does that look like? What do those trainings look like? What does it look like to help your teachers get prepared like that? Okay. Um, for any school that is newly implementing restorative justice, we do a series of trainings typically. Um, and the trainings are 
broken down into three tiers. Uh, tier one would be community building circles, um, restorative conversations. Uh, these are uh, skills that we'd like teachers to have, school security officers to have, cafeteria workers to have, uh, the entire school community. Uh, many people incorrectly think of restorative justice as a conflict resolution modality that only comes into play after harm has occurred. But after our seven or so years of experience in Oakland, we are realizing that uh, perhaps the most effective use of restorative justice in terms of transforming school climate, in terms of transforming youths and teachers' lives, would be this community building function of restorative justice. Um, so it could look like check-in circles in the classroom, values generating circles in the classroom, academic circles or discussions taking place in circles. Uh, so that would be the tier one training that we'd like every member as much as possible uh, of the school community to do. And it's usually a two day training that's experiential and it also provides an introduction to the principles uh, and practices of restorative justice. Then um, tier two would involve conflict circles, circles or family group conferences as an alternative to suspensions, as an alternative to exclusionary school discipline. Typically, you have a much narrow, narrower set of people taking that training. It would be the, the restorative justice coordinator, perhaps, or a dean of discipline, or a vice principal, or a counselor, or any other individual who is tasked uh, with, um, with discipline at the school. We, when we first started, would train teachers in conflict circles and, and they'd say after the training, oh, this was a great training. It's really altered my life. It's amazing. But then we'd look six months down the road hmm. and they weren't really implementing uh, the circles. And we, we gradually realized that it was unrealistic to expect teachers to do conflict circles because those are very um, uh, time uh, intensive. You have to prepare the person causing harm and, and family members, a person harmed and family members and everybody else impacted that takes time and then it takes a lot of time to do the circle itself so we realized there's no way teachers can do these kinds of circles on a regular basis so that's when we started understanding that uh, we would do the tier one circles for for the teachers and others and the tier two trainings um, mostly for those persons who are tasked specifically with uh, responsibility for discipline. And then the third tier would involve uh, teaching or training in, in re-entry circles um, to help youth re-enter in, into their school communities after a period of absence due to incarceration or suspension. So that's an overview of the three level, three tier trainings that we do. And of course, you're training the whole time, the training, you, you do professional development throughout the year as well, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. Great. Eric, did you have anything you want to add to that? Well, uh, uh, along with that, there's a daily convert, restorative conversation that we're having with teachers and students alike, and um, bridging those gaps of, um, of, of communication and relationships between teachers and students happen every day, and it's always a learning experience. So um, like Ms. Davis said, it's, it's an ongoing kind of uh, training. It's not a specific. I mean, we do have the specific tier one, tier two, tier three trainings, but we also have this thing that we do all year long and we're learning together. We learn new and different stuff about each other um, every single day, students and teachers alike. Yeah. And, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and it mostly has something to do with how, how we're going to be with each other. For years and years and years, we've been the same kind of authoritatory kind of thing with students. And right now we're teaching a, a parallel kind of relationship that works way better than the uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking down to a student kind of uh, behavior tactics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes me excited to hear what you're doing. Um, I, I will just tell you a little bit of my own background. Um, mm -hmm. So I was in a graduate program and I experienced a lot of uh, outcomes of suspensions and expulsions that I could see weren't really working. 
Um, and so as I was studying um, educational psychology, I began looking for potential alternatives. I hadn't ever heard of restorative justice and kind of in a, a fluky conversation with a, a distant cousin, I heard about restorative justice in her work, uh, working with juvenile justice system. And so I naively asked, is anybody doing anything like that in schools? And she recommended I read Judy Mullet and Lorraine Amstrad's book, which I did. And then I began reading and, and I believe you said you devoured it. I think that's an appropriate word for the next three or four years. I devoured everything that I could find to read about restorative justice. Unfortunately, I didn't know anybody that was doing it. Um, and so when I got ready to graduate and look for a job, I thought, where are those people? And so they're here at EMU, some of them. And so I I came here and have been really thrilled to work with people who um, are leaders in the field of restorative justice and, and call them now friends and colleagues. And they've pushed me in my understanding of what restorative justice uh, looks like and have worked so diligently to help move our education department into a place where we can begin to offer some specific coursework. Um, what I kept hearing uh, is a, a lot of people talk about, they went to a workshop, they heard about restorative justice, they were trained in it, and then when they got out in schools, they didn't know what to do. And so I began to think, what if we started embedding that in our teacher education programs? What if we could be more strategic in making sure that when teachers finish with their teaching credentials, they've at least experienced and encountered um, some exposure to restorative justice, so we're not starting scratch when we introduce it. And then what if we were could offer some more systematic instruction, both in theory and in practice uh, at a graduate level? So um, for EMU, we began um, this, this semester offering um, both a certificate program and a concentration. I uh, pulled up um, just real quickly, I'll share this slide if I can, if I can figure out how to do this. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is kind of the, the theory through which we understand restorative justice, the big three ideas here. And just like Fania, you were talking about so much of the time we think about restorative justice is the repairing harm and transforming conflict. And I just want to say that's for us a, a third of what we, we talk about but that a big core of what we just do here at EMU is, is this creating just and equitable learning environments. Um, so we talk a lot about differentiating instruction, and we talk a lot about issues of equity, we talk about disproportionality, we talk about racism and sexism and other isms that cause students to feel disenfranchised. Um, and then, of course, a lot of what we do is talk about this building and maintaining healthy relationships. Eric, I was glad to hear you talk about social and emotional uh, pieces, um, the assumption that all students uh, share an understanding of what it means to even own their own emotions um, is something we want to we'll talk about in our program, just not making that assumption and providing spaces for, for students to be able to express in healthy ways the anger, the sadness, the frustration that they're feeling and, and creating places where our relationships can handle those things. So this is just kind of a an overview theoretically. And I think in our undergraduate program, we probably embed all of that in um, what we do. Um, am I still sharing? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, how do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. Yeah, there we go. Um, in addition, though, we are putting the graduate program together so that um, we are offering some more specific courses, and let's try that. If I can show you that one. Yeah, so this, this screen right here um, looks at the uh, core courses in our graduate programs. The first three are um, required for the certificate program, the 15-hour certificate. Um, the first one being an overview, uh, the second one being uh, just an understanding of peace building and conflict resolution, and the third one talking specifically about restorative discipline. Um, but then the others are offered as both electives in the certificate program and, as, and part of the concentration in the MA and Ed program as well. So 
providing some some structure to how we're preparing teachers uh, hopefully on the front end um, so that when they get into classrooms they they already have some skills in place and some knowledge in place that they uh, can become uh, restorative justice educators so um, that's kind of what we're doing here at EMU I'm pretty excited about um, the model that we're using and uh, and it's it's great to hear what y'all are doing because I feel like we're doing similar things but in different contexts and um, so yeah so this is kind of a strange place being the facilitator and one of the panelists because now I need to transition to the place where I want to come back and ask another question um, and maybe we can move now to a more just conversational uh, piece um, and maybe this is an obvious question, but what is, um, what is it so critical? Why is it so critical uh, to make sure that our teachers are well prepared, that they're equipped um, with what they need, both knowledge and skills uh, to do restorative justice and be restorative justice educators? I can, I can answer that question with, with, with a story. Great. Um, my, my first my first year doing restorative justice um, um, at, a, at a pretty large high school, um, there was a student come, came in and we was, we was brand new at restorative justice. We were just now learning how to uh, have these restorative conversations. Um, well, this kid comes in and he, put his, he puts his head on the desk every day and falls right to sleep. Um, after a while, the teacher started feeling like this is a little bit disrespectful. Um, and, and she's asked that this kid that doesn't do that and didn't matter every day he came in and did the exact same thing. Well, she nudged him. She poked him and asked him to wake up. He woke up. And once he woke up, he proceeded to cuss everybody out that was, um, in his, in his sight. Um, she told the principal because she felt, um, threatened because he did threaten her. And, um, and the principal idea of dealing with that situation was let's get rid of this kid because he's disrespectful the kid even disrespected the principal i asked could i spend a little time with the kid the kid came in my classroom and just immediately started just letting me have it um so after a little while i told him that they were gonna they were gonna suspend him there wasn't nothing that i can do about it but if he had something that he wanted to say that i would advocate for him he, uh, he sat there for a minute and he thought about it and he, pr he proceeded to tell me a story about how his mother used to be on drugs and he hadn't seen her in three nights. Um, because he hadn't seen her in three nights, he had to get up early in the morning and bring his sister and his brother to school at, at the elementary school. And um, he hadn't eaten breakfast. He hadn't gotten a lot of sleep in the past three night, nights, and he's worried about his mother. And I asked him, could I um, convey that to the principal? And he said, yes. He didn't even think that anything would, um, that anything would happen. He was just like, well, go and tell him. So I, so I told the principal, and the, principal's, uh, the principal said, we were just about to suspend this kid and remove him out of our community when he probably deserves an award. So to answer your question um it's critical that teachers learn these tools because we've been kicking kids out of school under these conditions under conditions where they deserve awards for years and um and what happens is ultimately they start to behave the way um we assumed that they were to behave when they wasn't behaving that way in the beginning at all they just they're doing things that's critical to their survival and um and we're putting them out of school for it so we have to put like like i said we have to put our kids in front of the students and teach them how to tell their story we have to teach the teachers how to also tell their stories in a way that doesn't um further harm and and, and further do damage thank you uh, you know those are the kinds of stories i i think that and I appreciate you telling a story 
thank you because it takes it away from just these ideas that we're discussing which are important ideas and puts it right down into these are kids lives we're talking about and they matter and we need to do this as well as we can because it's the kids that are being impacted by our failure to do it well. Um, so. Um, one of the things that I would like to take us to a question, um, when we talk about teachers, we, we often talk about their knowledge, what they know, and their skills, what they can do. Um, we also talk, I think, sometimes in, in our world, we talk about praxis, this notion of theory and practice that are combined. So when you're teaching teachers, and, and going through trainings, how do we blend and find that balance between knowing how to do things, the practices, and knowing why we're doing them and the, the theory, the, the knowledge that goes along with that? And how, how do we blend that? Um, I, I think of some experiences that I've had not so much with teachers, but primarily with principals. But I think that the um, the insight would be uh, valuable in, in respect to teachers, even though this story is about a principal. Uh, there was a principal that we were working with who learned about restorative justice at a an intro, at an introductory training. He'd probably read some articles about it. He knew the data and uh, said to us, yeah, we want you here. Bring your program to this school. We, we want to do restorative justice here. Um, and we support this. Uh, however, months later, when there was, there was a big fight at the school, the principal just reverted to kind of reflexive, uh, punitive responses and ended up uh, suspending all of the youth that were involved, most of whom were, were black youth and Latino youth. Um, and even though he had the theory, he had the data, he saw the PowerPoints, he hadn't quite, he hadn't really, he wasn't embodying that paradigm shift. And I want to contrast that with another teacher who had the theory, again, had the data, but still was not really changing her behavior in significant ways until she got to sit in a well-facilitated circle and experience the power, the transformational power of, of that circle process. And that's when it changed for her. That's when she really turned the corner right. and, and, um, and made her whole school uh, restorative. In fact, that's the school where Eric is at today. And they have had no violence at that school in the last two years, even though it's a juvenile justice involved uh, youth or school it's, it's a, what is it called, a continuation school uh, where all of the youth of juvenile justice involved. And even though there had been a history of lots of violence at this school, a no violence for the last two years and no suspensions. This same teacher, when she only got the PowerPoint and the data, was suspending at a rate of something like 19% of her students. But as soon as she sat in the circle, she, something clicked in. Mm -hmm. So I, I think... Um, having an embodied um, uh, a whole experience of the power of this work is really critical in making that that um, that leap from theory to to practice. And and, and there's there's power in in, in these stories. Um, the the data and the uh, and, and 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 all of this all of that stuff is important. Um, we have I, I, we've had a kid two years ago. Um, his name's Dion, and the exact same way when 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 the teachers heard about restorative justice and knew that I would be on campus, I have three or four teachers come in and, and they're saying, we, "We've heard about restorative justice. We've read about it. Um, we think that it's an exciting thing. It's it's new. It's going to be great, but it's but it's not going to work for everybody. And here are the kids that it's not going to work for. So we've already started." separation which is completely against what we're doing with restorative justice but as a practitioner i have to listen and engage in this conversation so um it's not going to work for this kid named dion and looking at dion and, and i can say dion's name because i got permission to tell his story dion's big and he's black he's really really dark 
and his eyes is always red. So the teachers are saying that his eyes is always red. He smokes weed every day. I'm going to kick him out of my class every day because I had him in the second grade and I had to kick him out of every class period I had him in in the second grade. So this assumption that Dion is the exact same kid who he was in the second, he's a senior now, who he was in the second grade is real. And it's not even, it's, it's not even, it's a bad thing, but it's a real thing. Listening to these conversations, these teachers are really, really afraid. So I'm having conversations with Dion, and Dion's not that kid that they described at all. But still, when he goes in his classroom, he's being kicked out because of the memory of him when he was in the second grade. Mm -hmm. um, he does smoke weed every day. So his eyes is red because he's high. Um, but nobody's having a conversation with him about what's real about being high. Um, they're just saying, don't come to school high. And of course, he's not going to listen to it. He's going to break all of the barriers that, that we put before him. He's going to break them down. Um, but but Dion, Dion and I are having real conversations every single day. After a while, Dion starts getting his work and starts getting his work that he didn't get before. So he's doing double the work, and we're having these conversations. In the restorative justice room. In, in the restorative justice room. Yeah. And he's, he's turning in all of his work, and he's getting graded for, graded for all his work. To make a long story short, at the end of the year, they tally up all of his grades, and his grades are the best grades in the school. So now he's our valedictorian. Hmm. The idea was we were supposed to kick him out of school. This happens not only with Dion. Dion is just the story that I'm telling you now. But this happens all the time. And that's why it's so important that the, the teachers are in front of the students. Dion didn't, I don't trust adults. It didn't have anything to do with whether or not you were a teacher or not. I took the time to have a, 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 an intentional conversation with them which was what he needed. And it didn't matter whether it was for me or his English teacher or his history teacher. He needed to hear from an adult that cared about it. So Dion, 2013, our valedictorian. Nice. That's beautiful. Um, you know, but I hear you talking though about dispositions. And so you, you jumped ahead of me, but that's great. Um, so it's not just about the knowledge and do we know what restorative justice is? Can we cite the, the research and, and know why it's important? But it is those dispositions. It's the, the nature, it's the attitude of the teacher towards the students. Um, I, in my own experience with teachers, I find that some teachers, whether they know about restorative justice or not, they are already bent that way. They already have a natural inclination to be relational, uh, to be restorative. And so it's easy to come in and start talking to them about how to facilitate a circle process or how to mediate conflict. And they naturally run with it because it's, it's in their heart to be that way. Absolutely. Then you have others who are so oriented to this punitive piece and they really just don't believe that without some type of deterrence, kids will ever change their behaviors. And so they, they, they are already resistant from the beginning. Like what do we do with teachers or administrators who are already experiencing those kinds of resistances and how do we work with them to, in, in the schools that we're trying to transform? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, it's constant. And, 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 and I work with a crew of folks. And we, we're, we're constantly con trying to come up with creative ideas of teaching. And not just the students. We're trying to, we're trying to we found out that all teachers are good. All teachers have something inside them that make them want to help other kids. So we find that goodness, and what we try to do is we try to um, tug at their heartstrings a little bit. If you knew that this kid, if you knew that this kid was waiting up for his mother to come home and that never showed, you have a little bit more sympathy for that kid when he comes to school Monday, Monday and puts his head on the desk. 
And now suddenly we can't have a all or nothing kind of um, approach to wrongdoings because sometimes we're going to have to collar that kid that's too tired. Mm -hmm. And if the results are going to be, if, if I hold this kid and, and I build this real relationship with him, I can get him to do whatever I want him to do. If that's the trade off, I'll take that nine times out of 10 and 11 times on Sunday. Tanya. Um, so the, the question, what was the original question, Kathy? When we experience resistance with teachers oh. who just aren't geared towards restorative values, how do we respond to those? Um, going back to what I said earlier, get them in a circle hmm. and not necessarily just a circle with uh, students. It's really important that teachers recognize that these processes help build their own uh, relationships with, with their peers. It's not just something we give to the students or that the, that the students need. Um, when they do relationship building circles with one another, you know, the, the typical response is, you know, after doing a series of trust building and relationship building and community building exercises, People will say, I've been working with this, this person for 10 years, and I've learned more about them in the last two hours uh, than I've known about them all these years. So getting them in their own circles um, and, and getting them in the circles with the youth as well, I think really makes a difference. And we find that you'll have early adopters, you'll have fence sitters, you'll have resistors. Um, and when some of these fence sitters and resistors start seeing how well it's going for the early adopters in terms of their classroom climate, in terms of their uh, student outcomes, uh, social and academic, um, uh, then they get sort of pulled in. The fence sitters come off the fence and the resistors come a little closer. But sometimes you don't, you're not going to get everybody. Sure. I mean, even at Cole Middle School, we had, we had at least one teacher. Um, we, that was always quite resistant, but you keep building, you keep going back. As Eric says, it's a constant, it's a constant uh, relationship building process that you're engaging in. You never want to, um, of course, uh, make them the other. That would be disastrous. Well, and even, even, even when say you're bringing restorative justice for the first time to a school, it's really important to include resistors in the early phases of discussion, um, just, yeah, for a stronger, a more solid foundation for implementation in, in, in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, Eric, what you said about every teacher has something good in them, even those that seem to be resistant, there's something good in there. And we would do the same thing with our students, or we would expect teachers to do the same thing. Can we search for that thing that is good and then build on that and, and key in on that. We were just having this conversation um, this past weekend, actually. Teachers who are under so much pressure externally, um, and then they began to experience this pressure from administrators or from state department or from testing or whatever. And that frustration often leads them to take things out on students. And so perhaps one of the, the most restorative things we could do to uh, facilitate teachers being more restorative is to treat teachers restoratively. And Absolutely. so I think there's a group of people that are gonna just start having dinner parties for teachers just to give them a space to vent, to be real, to sit and circle with one another, to experience healing, if you will, uh, so that they are whole themselves and then can be, be more fully attentive and relational with their students. And I don't know, is that a good idea? I like it. <laughs> I like it. Build, just, just building relationships is a good idea. Um, it's, it's easier for me to um, hold you accountable if we're friends. Mm -hmm. So if we're teachers and we're, we all have this space and we, we go to this place and, um, and we're eating, food's always good, um, and, and, and we're having this intentional conversation about how do, how do we be better at our job? If we're friends, I can tell you what you said earlier today to the kid was kind of racist without having that that thing, that uncomfortable thing. So, and that uncomfortable thing, what we're trying to do is identify that uncomfortable thing 
and put it out there. Let's 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 do what it is. Let's let's talk about what it is. And sometimes, like Miss Davis was saying, if we're getting um, teachers in circle, those circles are so rich and so powerful. We're finding out things about ourselves that we had no idea. And sometimes those things that we find out about ourselves are the is the is the very thing that's stopping us from being a successful piece of our school culture or our our um, classroom environment. Exactly. Well, just along those notes, just in the courses that we're offering here, I'm teaching a class right in about two hours. Um, and we start every class period with about 30 or 40 minutes in circle for that purpose. And it feels, it feels indulgent because it's a two hour mm. course. Really, we're gonna spend 30 to 40 minutes in circle Yes, absolutely, all day, every day, because what happens on the other end of that circle is so much more rich and deep, and we can go to some really beautiful places, I think, because we've built classroom community, and, um, and so I think feeling that, experiencing that as undergraduate students and knowing, huh, this, this does make a, a difference in the way learning happens, um, because there is a safe community there I think is an important piece of it's that experiential piece that you're talking about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the clock mm -hmm. and I, are there last last words on equipping teachers before we move to general questions from from the participants we just can't make them the other we have to we have to include them no matter how much no matter how it looks no matter how much they fight and resist against um, what we know is right. We can't say, okay, y'all go over there and we're, we're going to be restorative over here. We have to include them and we have to, um, I don't even like saying include them. We're all in this together. Yeah, that's right. So they, they're just learning at a, at a slower pace. Mm -hmm. And, and I, yeah. Um, yes. I think that, um, it's yeah, including teachers and getting them in circle as much as possible, mm -hmm. and and understanding that it's not just the teachers uh, that need to be equipped. Uh, it's really difficult to imagine a restorative, a success, fully successful restorative classroom as an island in a school that is punitive. Mm -hmm. So in addition to thinking about how we prepare teachers, how do we make this a whole school thing? Um, because the teachers can't really do the work uh, unless there's some sort of consensus in the whole school that this is the way we do things. Because in Ms. Jones' classroom, you know, there might be a really punitive um, uh, approach. But then coming to uh, Mr. Uh, What's your last name? Butler. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to Mr. Butler's classroom, you know, you got a restorative thing happening. The teacher will not be successful with a restored approach in the classroom if Ms. Ms. Jones is doing something completely different or if the principal is on it. So I just want us to kind of expand our view of, of, of this business of equipping teachers. It's also equipping the whole school. Exactly. Okay. And, and I, I, I know that in your model, you talk about everybody in the school. Um, not just teachers and administrators, um, but cafeteria workers. Yes. yes. Uh, SSO, school security officers, librarian. Right. In fact, um, the SSO piece is, I think, really important. Um, it, as schools increase the school security guards on campus, as that's happening, can they be equipped to understand and implement restorative of justice? Uh, so yeah, I think that's a really big piece as well. Absolutely, it's imperative. The, 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 the students see the SSO first and it dictates the rest of their day. That interaction, that quick one minute interaction mm -hmm. could dictate the rest of the day. When I first started working at Bunch, the kids would get frisked down and, um, and the kid would be mad about it and the kid would walk off and probably say something cussing at the um, SSO out. And the SSO would always say, if you had not done what you did to get to this school, you wouldn't have to worry about getting patted down. And they bring that to their first period classroom. So having a discussion with my friends, the SSO, I had a suggestion that before you pat them down, 
how about a handshake and a good morning? Let's just try that. And when they started to try that, they started building these relationships with the kids. Now, at lunchtime, our SSO is playing chess with some of the most dangerous kids in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And if I can piggyback on that, um, because this is a, a, a school for juvenile justice involved youth, there are actual police officers, not, not simply the private security guards that are stationed, but actual Oakland police officers. Mm -hmm. And um, there had been a lot of tension, as you can imagine, between the youth and the police officers. Um, and Eric decided to facilitate a healing circle between uh, the police assigned to that campus and the youth. And it was extraordinary. Um, they started out very far apart uh, with stereotypes about one another, ended up sharing stories and coming to understandings. Mm -hmm. And they ended up uh, deciding to play um, basketball together. And the youth won the basketball game. And, yeah, it's, and, it's, it's today. and okay, it's, it's an ongoing, it's been going on for a year and a half, I think, since that circle. So. There's a really good relationship. Some of the officers are even mentoring the kids in the evening, Absolutely. And which is huge, you know. If you look at what's happening nationally, you know, with Ferguson and Trayvon Martin, and, and even the federal government is, has uh, issued an initiative to promote more trust between uh, communities and the law enforcement officers that serve those communities. Right. So we're, we're developing, using restorative justice to create good relationships with everyone on the school campus. Well, and I, I think it was one of the reasons why when we started trying to name the restorative justice and education concentration here at EMU, we went with restorative justice in education and not just restorative justice in schools, because mm -hmm. I want us to be broad enough to conceive that education could also be after school programs, it could be nonprofit organizations, it could be school counselors, um, it could be all kinds of, of educationally based contexts. Um, so yeah, teachers, principals, community workers, et cetera, et cetera. And let's just keep that list going long. Um, good. Well, the questions are kind of pouring in. Carl, I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to, they're, they're, they're looking like some great questions in. So I'm going to uh, shoot them out there and let any one or, or a number of you, three of you who want to respond to them. Uh, some are really practical. Uh, so they might be a, it might be simple to ask uh, answer them fairly quickly. Others are a little bit more um, in depth in the sense of you might have to do some more descriptive work. Let's see what we can get through on these questions. Thanks for those who've been sending them in. The first question: How do you input restorative justice into the school's curriculum? Um, and then an added question I connected to that: Do the students have the ability to quote unquote circle up on a daily basis? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are related questions. And um, we need to do more um, work with infusing restorative justice in algebra curricula and social studies curricula and history. We haven't gotten there yet. There may be some people doing it on an isolated basis, but we, we haven't gotten there yet here. Um, we are just really beginning to develop implementation guides and curricula for trainings. Uh, here in Oakland. We're at that stage now. Um, time is, I'm sorry, no, time is always a factor. And, um, and we can definitely circle up because you're going to spend that time regardless. So either you're going to spend it in circle or we're going to spend it doing something punitive and kicking kids out, some stuff that we really don't want to do. So um, it's, it's not a matter of, of if we're going to spend this time together. It's, it's a matter of how we're going to do it. That's and what can, what can be done and what is done, uh, and Eric can t tell you, share stories with you about that, is that teachers are doing circles in their classroom, either at the very beginning of class, just to kind of take the emotional temperature uh, of, of all of the students, uh, and or to actually have an academic discussion, mm -hmm. a discussion about slavery in circle, a discussion um, about um, American history in, in, in circle. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's what we're seeing here. We, we're not seeing it actually infused uh, and fully infused into uh, the subject matter, um, into the subject matters that are being taught by the teachers. But we are seeing circles happening in the classroom, 
sometimes advisory, um, where all of the school is doing uh, these circles, and sometimes on a class-by-class -class basis. Mm -hmm. Nice. One of the things I was thinking too, um, when we talk about creating just and equitable learning environments, when I think about that with, with regard to curriculum, I'm also thinking about how we teach our history classes, um, how we present uh, our literature courses, whose literature is created as the most important literature and, and how is that presented and if we're presenting it from a, a, a wopsided perspective okay. then we're not creating just an equitable learning environments and that by default will not be very restorative and so just working with curriculum to make sure that that it is presented as just it is presented in ways that promote um, those ideals and where it's not then addressing that through circle processes and and uh, allowing space for for people to 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 chime in and uh, have fruitful ways of expressing their frustration with their the the lack of justice. Um, yeah, I, I I say sometimes you know when a when a student stands up and gets angry about a class and says this class is stupid, we should we should come back and ask what is it about the class that they may be experiencing as not okay, and in that moment their resistance might be the most appropriate behavior, and if we punish that, then we're shutting down perhaps um, their activist self, their their. <laughs> Moving moving into a, a place of of leadership actually, and so creating those kinds of spaces, even embedded in our curriculum, I think is is really important. And, and, we're, and we're shutting down a a learning moment, Absolutely. a learning moment for the whole class, possibly. And it means, as the instructors, we have to be able to step back and swallow our ego and say, what's the learning mo moment here, and how can we build on it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Another question here. I highly appreciate the focus on starting with the proactive rather than the reactive. Uh, and then centers in, are the circles the sole tool you employ for building community? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and the thing is, we, we're, we're, we're calling them circles, but they're intentional conversations. A circle can be just me and another person. So um yes we're we're using um we're using circles as the tool as, as a vehicle to have these um these much needed conversations good i'm going to move on to one that and, I and, 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 yeah go ahead i just wanted to add a story that gives a sense of a cultural change that has happened by using these circles um last fall i was at eric's school bunch and I had spoken at the school's graduation in May. And I noticed that in the restorative justice room, a group of girls came in. And they said, oh, well, Ms. Davis, we really enjoyed your, your, your speech at the graduation. I said, yeah, you graduated. So why, why are you here? How come you're here? And they said, well, we had a conflict in the community. And we came back here because we wanted to handle it with a circle. And it's just an amazing story because the youth here are learning to talk through uh, in circle instead of fight through uh, differences. And it's a real cultural change that we're starting to see. And one of the most, according to FBI statistics, uh, dangerous uh, cities in the country. Hmm. That's right. Okay, I'm going to keep moving us. There's going to be there. These are going to be jumping, but I, I think we've got some really good questions here. I want to keep catching, capturing them. Um, here's one. Can you describe briefly the content and approach of your professional development? Let me, um, she adds a little bit more to this. What is creative about your training? How do you make the space for the resistor? I think we talked to that a little bit. How do you ensure that your participants don't leave thinking RJ is just another tool? to add to a whole bunch of other tools to address negative behavior. In other words, is there a way in which you're, I think I'm understanding this to be saying, how does this get inculcated into the teacher's psyche, if you will, almost? <laughs> can, you, 
can you share the story? Eric has a great story to share. Um, and it's a story not about a formal training that occurs, but about that daily learning that happens uh, in informal ways and sometimes even more powerfully. Um, the story of the, the cyberbullying role play that you did. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, to make it, making, making um, learning interesting, um, like I said, I have a crew of folks that we get together and we actually try to think of creative um, ways that are, um, that are, uh, that has something to do with today. Um, so what Ms. Davis is talking about was we were having like some cyber bullying going on around the school and it was just word of mouth. It wasn't nothing physical happening. It was just folks talking about a, a lot of Facebook stuff. Um, <clears throat> it was getting out of hand. So me and my principal and, um, and a couple other folks on campus, we decided to do a mock fight between the adults on campus. And the fight was about um, some cyber stuff that was happening. I had posted some some pictures of somebody, one of the other teachers on Facebook, and um, she was upset about it. And instead of us getting in a circle, she just kind of lashed out at me. I lashed out back. It started this eruption of a um, of an argument. It happened right at lunchtime. The principal got involved. The principal came and she fired everybody. And um, the students are standing around us in shock and they're just kind of like, what's going on? And this isn't a very good look because you guys teach us a different kind of thing all the time. Um, so why aren't we in circle? And you can hear the chatter while we're doing this mock kind of fight. Like, why aren't we in circle? This isn't a good look. So um, we turned around and we said, well, it was a big trick. We were, we were faking. Um, but we used that as, a, as an opportunity to have the, these conversations about cyberbullying. We knew that we couldn't just get in a circle and say, we're going to talk about this thing that's so hot right now as a way like we don't like it. So what we did was we showed them how it looked. Then we had a conversation about it. And that's kind of the way we do trainings too. Like um, we want to tug at your heartstrings. So if we can do that, we're gonna do whatever we, we gotta do to, to make that happen. And our trainings are fun and interactive and, um, and folks don't usually walk out and <laughs> fall asleep. And then I remember one teacher who was very resistant earlier, you know, I've already got too much stuff to do. I've got to teach them this curriculum and that, you know, I've got to get them ready for the, for the, for the test. Um, but then after doing the circles, even 10 minute check in circles in her classroom, um, she found that that really settled the students down and, and, and made them more open to learning. And she got to the point where she said, Oh, I can't afford not to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take one here. This is um, sort of with the resistance in the system. This us move to the system. Do educators and administrators have to acknowledge that at one point the school system was an oppressive mechanism to the students in order to have a restorative justice environment? In other words, if the oppressor is unaware or is denying that he or she is oppressing, then how can the oppression stop? Right. That's a really great question. <laughs> <laughs> And, and is that a question? From a systems thinker, well, yeah. like gonna go, no, you can't. Like if the students are feeling victimized by an oppressive schooling system, if you don't address that oppression, how in the world can we expect students then to address their own quote unquote misbehavior, their own offensive behaviors, right? right. If if their behaviors are stemming from that oppression, we better start first and acknowledge our own complicity in oppressive systems and then create a space where we can then work on healing. We can't ask them to own up to being offenders if they are first operating out of a, a role of victim. But I mean, that's, I think, Yes. Yeah. Well, there's a related question here, too, that says, if the school is punitive, but I want a restorative classroom, 
how would you recommend the classroom practices be, you know, use restorative principles if the system's punitive? Is it, maybe, maybe we should back up and say, is it possible? I guess that's, that's how the two are related. What happens in that situation is the whole school comes to that one classroom. So you, you have no students in any of the other classrooms. Hmm. They're cutting class just to be in that non-punitive environment that they need so much. Hmm. So that's what's going to happen. They'll break the rules since the rules, those barriers are for me to break because the punishment exists. The punishment has to happen. So I'll break those rules doing something good by going to classroom that's non-punitive. And maybe y'all should follow the same kind of thing. Those, this is what the kids are thinking. I don't mind breaking those rules because what I need is in this restorative justice classroom. And if you're not gonna give it to me in the algebra, I'll just stay in here all, all day long because I'm going to fail algebra anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question um, raises some, some other issues, too, uh, of power. Um, even if it's not, a, a, you know, even in the context of a teacher dominating a discussion, for example. Um, for example, we were doing some circles after a big fight at a school. And there was a teacher in the art class where I was, I was sitting in on that circle uh, who uh, tended to stand up and dominate the conversation and act as if she were teaching a class where everyone's focused on her, everyone is looking to her, you know, for the teachings and for the wisdom. Um, that's what teachers are accustomed to. And for teachers to be able to sit in a circle and truly except that the voice of this 14-year-old middle school student is just as important as my voice, just as important as the principal who's sitting in this circle or the police officer's voice. Um, we were sitting in a circle at Eric's school the other day, and a young woman during a reflection round said, you know, I really like, I like these circles because I feel like when I talk to the adults, they don't, they don't try to act like they're smarter than me. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. But, but for, you know, that's part of equipping teachers as well. Uh, you know, how, are, how do we um, really connect with, with students, you know, younger than we are, less experienced than we are, mm -hmm. um, and a student-teacher relationship in equal ways, and, you know, as humans, mm -hmm. as opposed to being caught up in this role of I'm the, I'm the all-knowing teacher and you're the, the, the sponge student. Uh, so that... You know, just that's a real paradigm shift for teachers alone. But one of the things that I've been trying to do is talk about restorative justice. So much of the, the theory about restorative justice comes from criminal justice field. And yet I find it very, very consistent with what we know of best practice in teaching. So as I'm teaching, for example, about Maslow and I'm teaching about um, motivation theory and we're looking at just the way we do pedagogy the way we do classroom interactions, can we do those interactions in a more inquiry-based approach, mm -hmm. a way that is student-centered, a way that values and honors the things that students bring to the learning environment? And so how do we set up even our instruction in ways that are more consistent with these ideas, these values, in ways that do honor the voices of students? And so mm -hmm. like, I think that all goes hand in hand together. The way we do instruction matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a huge part of preparing our teachers. We're beginning to do trainings here in Oakland uh, to develop the capacity of adults to recognize, to hear the voice uh, of students and, and to recognize their leadership uh, uh, capacity. Yeah. There's, there's some related questions because we're, we're running against the clock. So I want to I want to combine a few here. Um, one of them, which I think is, is, is critical, and that is, um, and you've alluded to it, but maybe you want to say a few more specific things with the introduction of RJ practices in Oakland schools. How have specifically Fania and Eric seen these practices impacting the whole neighborhood beyond the school building? Right on. Okay. I live in my neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood with my uh, that my school's in, and um, and it's interesting to watch the trends. And I've known these kids for five or six years, and to watch the um, the generation that that before them 
kind of have a different path into the rest of their lives that this particular group of kids have. Um, for instance, I, I, I'll just give you a, a quick example. Um, one one thing that's that's really relevant and um, in in my particular neighborhood is the use of the N word. So just us having conversations about that has changed the culture in using that word to, to where they were saying that we want to know who it offends. And after we find out who it offends, we will try not to use it in front of those folks. So now there's a group of kids that don't use that word anymore because um, they just got tired of saying they were sorry for, uh, for using the word. And that's just an example of how it changed um, situations outside of the school um, uh, climate. Students are wanting to go to college because we're having conversations, real conversations about college and, 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 and real expectations about, um, uh, uh, they're wanting to go into the workforce. They want to find out like kids that don't want to go to college, like what avenues do I have? And those conversations weren't being had, ha what weren't happening before we implemented restorative justice. And yeah. this is just things that are happening outside of the community. Good. Yeah. And, and I'd add that uh, a report actually just came out um, of, of outcomes in the last three years of restorative justice practice, uh, system wide in OUSD. Some amazing findings. Uh, one is that. Students in restorative circles report enhanced ability to understand their peers, improve their home environment, and maintain positive relationships with peers. Um, you hear stories of students using circles with their friends in the, in the neighborhood, like those girls who came in. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they're also community organizations, restorative justice organizations that are developing today. And I think that's in part uh, a rippling out of the work that we've been doing in the schools. Uh, there's an organization, for example, called the North Oakland Community Restorative Justice Council that has been doing circles after youth are killed, uh, planting trees in their memory, painting murals and, uh, and creating a park uh, that's a peacemaking park. And now they're negotiating with the police to enter into an MOU for um, a diversion program so that the youth arrested in that neighborhood um, or charged uh, for a crime in that neighborhood will not be, uh, they'll be diverted uh, to a restorative process. So we're seeing a lot of rippling effects like that. But that particular organization is, is, is really pretty remarkable, the work that they're beginning to do uh, in that particular neighborhood. And if I could just speak to the role of parents and caregivers as well, mm -hmm. so many times parents and caregivers have been so disenfranchised from the educational process. They feel left out, teachers don't consult them, uh, they, they get usurped, you know, they get avoided, sidestepped. And so many times they've just walked away from the educational system and they, they yeah. then Teachers, I hear, sometimes want to say, well, the parents don't care about their kids' education. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, back up a bit. Um, you know, what have we done to bring them into that community? And so what does the restorative justice process look like that would include parents and caregivers so that they feel like they're a part of the learning community and that they aren't being pushed away? Um, and, and maybe that also speaks to that role of, of power that you were bringing up, you know do we honor the parents and caregivers' voices as well? I, they've, they've been doing great work at Bunch with parents. Can you talk about that a little bit, Eric? Well, um, we, we interview every kid and their parents. So we have a circle with every single student and their parents on before they enter into the school culture. Um, and, and that's just to talk to them about our expectations and what makes our school different from other schools. Um, what, what, what are going to be your, um, what are going to be some challenges? What, um, and that makes a huge, huge difference. And um, in, in the start of, in the start of the, uh, the kids academic career at school. Um, I like to, I like to have 
close relationships with every single person that enters the campus. So if if we're having a situation um, where a kid's not coming to school, I want to be able to come to the house and have a conversation with the parents and the students at home. It goes, it, it, restorative justice doesn't stop um, once we leave off that school campus. It, um, it follows the kid all the way to um, home. So it's, um, it's wraparound support for the whole family. That's fantastic. Just just to throw it out a little bit here, some folks are talking, um, I'm going to put some combination together here, but I'd like to hear from each of you. Some are saying, what is the first step if we're having a hard time getting our minds around where do we start in a school system that doesn't seem to have a clue about restorative justice? What are your recommendations for first steps for folks? Um, Kathy, did you want to respond to that or should I? Um, well, I mean, I think that I would start with getting some experience, some knowledge, finding places where it's happening. Um, I, for me, I will just say that my first experience was to go to a week-long circle process training. Um, and so I spent five days in circle, and it rocked my world um, because I'd never experienced that kind of, of healthy dialogue communication and um and and i think when we talk about that experiential piece i think in those moments i felt what a circle was and the beauty of that being in relationship where everybody's perspective was was brought um i i know that it's theoretical knowledge but i will i don't want to apologize for the years that i just read and read everything that i could find i've that's, I think, understanding what we mean when we talk about restorative justice, I think, is an important piece. I don't think we can stop there. Mm -hmm. I think we have to understand uh, uh, how we, we have to learn how to do the skills and build those relationships. But, but I think being knowledgeable about what, what we mean when we talk about restorative justice. You know, I guess if there's restorative justice practices already going on in your community, connect with them. Sure. If it's not, then get in touch with somebody where, where it is happening. And I'm going to, and there are people asking that question right there. Where, where can we get this training? Cause we don't, we don't know of it in our local area. So even if you, all of you would want to think about a place to name or where did you go to get into your circles, Kathy? I was in uh, Minnesota. Um, uh, Oscar and Jamie, good grief. I can't even remember last names, but they do some circle process training. And then of course I sat in on Kay's uh, circle process training course as well. Uh, of course, this is where I, of course, do the shameless plug. If you're wanting to do some no. restorative justice work, uh, EMU now offers a 15 hour uh, certificate program in restorative justice and education. And I think that would be a really great place to, to start getting some experience and some understanding as well. Sure. And on the West Coast, uh, <laughs> restorative justice for Oakland youth does trainings. There's also a restorative justice training institute. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are, there are increasing numbers of organizations that are offering trainings um, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those of you with the social media, if you go to Facebook and type restorative justice, there's at least four or five different restorative justice Facebook groups. Uh, doing a variety of things. So that might be a place to connect with the community and get more information as well. And I don't know if the question earlier, um, Carl, was addressed to uh, starting restorative programs in schools. I, yes. I, it seems that like one of those questions uh, uh, yes, was. There was. Uh, there is, I just wrote a blog on Edutopia called Eight Tips for Schools Interested in Restorative Justice on Edutopia. Um, and I think that can be, that link can be sent out with materials later, I, I was told by Brian, I believe. But there's a step-by-step -step sort of a guide to getting things started at your school um, in, in this blog. Okay. That's great. Carl, can everybody see the questions that are being asked? No, you and I are working with them. So jump in, because there's lots of them. Good ones. There is a there is a one right here. I'll just put a plug in St. Croix Valley Restorative yeah. Justice Program. 
located in River Falls, Wisconsin, just 40 minutes from the Minneapolis airport, offers both circle keeper training and most recently added advanced practice school-based circles implementation. Excellent. So thank you, Chris, for sending that in. Yeah. Other questions? So let's 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 hit on something else here. Um, I have another question here that I that I think is important. That is, the school is always asking me for <laughs> evidence-based practices and practices that are quant quantitative and are research-based because that's what the administration is looking for. I find it difficult to present restorative justice quantitatively to school administrators. Advice from the panelists. Fine. Uh, the, the, the report that you just mentioned would be a great place to start. Oh, yes. And there's so much, uh, there's increasing uh, reports, uh, studies, data, findings about the effectiveness of restorative, of school-based restorative justice. Um, yeah, there, so the one that I just mentioned, I think I'll have to give you the link for that. I, mm -hmm. There's, it just was released, so um, that's the best we can do. But it is a report that was prepared uh, for the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we are in a voluntary resolution plan um, to settle a complaint of racial disparity in, in uh, school discipline. And this is the first report uh, to the Office of Civil Rights that looks at, at outcomes over the last three years, which are just amazing. Uh, for example, um, for over three years, about 50% of the staff received reduced referrals for all students, 53% for African-American students. 88% of teachers reported RJ was very or somewhat helpful in managing difficult student behaviors in the classroom. 60% uh, of staff believe that RJ has helped reduce suspensions at their schools. And the actual reductions in suspensions uh, were something like 50% uh, over that period of time. We also have incredible um, uh, outcomes in terms of uh, uh, reading levels, uh, graduation rates, uh, when you compare restorative justice schools to non-restorative justice schools. Um, just some amazing data. Uh, so this might be helpful. In addition, um, there are a couple of other research studies that have been published, and if somebody wanted to email me those, I could send you those full reports. Um, Ann Gregory's got a new research study out on specifically looking at schools, comparing uh, disproportionality statistics uh, for schools using RJ and schools not using RJ. Um, and then uh, there's a couple of other reports, but I'd be glad to email those to, to somebody if you wanted to email me. One of the things we, we can do on the website is put some of these resources up after this webinar. So if Fanya and Kathy want to send those together, we can put them together, put the links on the website following our webinar here. Um, so uh, let's, let me just touch here again. I think there's a few questions here hinting to the fact, okay, what happens when restorative justice doesn't work? What are you doing? When does it not work? <laughs> there you go. Well, I don't know. You can push back on that. Some people are saying, we're wondering, what happens? What do you do when, you, when it doesn't get solved, when the conflict isn't solved restoratively or by restorative justice process? What processes and you're are you talking, And you're talking about conflict. Yeah. Now we're talking about conflict. Oh. This is what the, that's what the um, question was on here. I haven't, I haven't had a, um, a conflict circle not work. Um, I've had I've had situations where we have to go back and um, do some more prep work. Um, you may have to have more than one circle, but I've never had a repeat fight after a, um, a mediation. So I'm looking at the data on this report. Um, so it says that 76 percent of the harm circles were successful in, in, in actually resolving um, the conflict and, and healing the harm. And I imagine that um, if, there, if those conflict circles were not successful, the student might need to go through the punitive process. I'm uh, assuming that that is probably what happened. 
Mm. And there's some cases where students don't take responsibility for what they've done. In those cases, of course, I would go into the um, um, punitive um, process. Well, and someone just responded that when you have a facilitator who's not well equipped and they don't know what they're doing, sometimes those things can go awry. You know, I was observing a circle once and uh, the past the talking piece to the third student and the teacher continued to want to comment on, uh, on what the students were saying. And I was like, no, you're missing the point here. And so I think making sure that the facilitator Mm, circle facilitators know what they're doing and they understand mm. the principles and the values of a circle so that those things don't go awry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's a few, um, I think we can talk to fairly quickly, but some language things for those who are coming and I think imagining from the question a bit new to the language here, what's the difference between restorative justice and restorative practices? <laughs> the word justice and Anybody want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, for, for me, um, I use restorative justice, school-based restorative justice. That's my preference. It's really a personal preference. Uh, many people say restorative practices versus restorative justice because it's their way of saying that it's not just a conflict resolution technique. A restorative practices and it also embraces uh, community building. It doesn't have to be a practice that is used after harm has occurred. Uh, so in, in those people, in, in that sense, people who uh, reject restorative justice are seeing justice as something that comes into play after harm has occurred. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm, I, I stick to it because I want us to shift the way that we think about and do justice so that it is a more relational justice. It's about being in right relationship, uh, being in good relationship with one another. It's not just something that happens after harm has occurred. Um, so that's why I, and I, you know, my, my, whole, my whole history too, my personal history as a social justice and racial justice advocate um, or activist and as a lawyer, um, but as, a, as an activist and lawyer who has really um, uh, integrated healing, uh, indigenous healing wisdom into my own practice, I would like to see a more indigenous kind of concept of justice, uh, which, um, it, which embraces the way that we relate to one another, the way that we relate to the earth, to our waters, to our air. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm sticking to my, <coughs> I don't want to say sticking to my guns, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to find um, another restorative way to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think the word, I think the word justice suggests that there's, there's going to be a resolution and it's going to be a just resolution that we all can agree with. And practices just mean we're going to always just do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and both of them are right. So. I use restorative justice because Ms. Davis does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think that, I think there's a broader philosophical thing here that some of us are, are thinking about beyond justice, as you said, Fami rightly said, not just a response to when harm has done, but justice as in just systems, just living. How do we live in just relationships? And some of us want to hold on to that because we know that even when there's not overt conflict, or overt violence, there are injustice in sometimes embedded in the systems mm -hmm. with power and other other inequalities that are that are causing a lot of rub and a lot of harm. Well, and, and if we look from a trauma perspective, I mean, like we know that these cycles of violence, cycles of trauma, and so it's really difficult to tease out who is victims, who is offenders. And so creating just structures, just relationships, just encounters, it is a way of identifying w those cycles are in play and we need to to bring about more just ways of of addressing those uh, harms even systemic ones especially those systemic ones well i want to we're going to have to close down now and i want to thank um all the panelists eric fania and um and also, Kathy, thank you so much. This has been a rich conversation for me. I've just been happy to be sort of here in the, in the listening posture, and it's been fantastic. 
I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now, but thank you to each of you. And I'm sorry for those out there who we didn't get to your questions. Beautiful questions, and they were coming in uh, left and right, and I wish we could have addressed them all. If you want to take up some of those questions with uh, us as panelists, feel free to, to drop us a line. I'm saying that for myself. I hope that's appropriate for the rest, too. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now and let Sarah take us through the last bit of, of just closing up the webinar. Sarah? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my PowerPoint here? Yes. We the can. OK. All right, great. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. And I'm just going to describe our upcoming ones. For those of you who are interested in joining us, November 24th, Integrating Customary Practice and Restorative Justice in Libya with Najla Mangush. And December 10th, Restorative Justice by Design, Using Restorative Justice Values to, to Design Transformative Spaces. And you can register like you did for today's at that link below. And um, we will be sending out a schedule for our spring ones um, coming up in the upcoming months. Other restorative justice educational opportunities here at CJP, the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, we have the Summer Peacebuilding Institute. Um, and at SPI, we have three restorative justice related courses. Um, that we invite you to attend and to participate in, and you can follow the link below to register for those. All of this is happening here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, and another thing that we offer is a master's degree in conflict transformation, and people can choose um, courses in restorative justice, psychosocial trauma, and several other areas, as you can see there. And this is a very integrative curriculum um, very practice-based, and um, we require a practicum at the end of that so that people can be practicing what they've, the tools that they've been learning. A new thing, in addition to the Restorative Justice and Education Certificate that Kathy mentioned, um, we are also offering a new Restorative Justice General Graduate Certificate, and that is new here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, and you can find out more at that link below. And lastly, going outside of specifically restorative justice, but to trauma awareness and resilience, which is also um, related, we offer two star type trainings, strategies for trauma awareness and resilience. Our star one training is coming up in February here in Harrisonburg. And we also have one during the Summer Peace Building Institute in May. And if you are interested in star two, uh, we have one that is coming up very soon, and you can register at the link below. Thanks. Back to you, Carl. So thank you again, and uh, we hope that we're going to have, um, for all of you who attended, we hope that this has been useful. If you've got more questions and need some more resourcing, do let us know. Uh, I'm going to let you go, and once again, thank our, our fantastic uh, guests and panelists. Thank you for your time, your energy, and your wisdom. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.